Uh, hello everyone, uh, my name is Mustafa Zantut. I am PhD student at the Nestle Lab working with Professor Manisir Fiskefa. It's my pleasure to be invited here for delivering, delivering a guest lecture about Android operating system and uh, Android app development. Uh, as Professor Mani uh, has mentioned, uh, the, under, the lecture will be split in two parts. First part is giving an overall overview about Android operating system. And second part will be like a demo uh, of how to build an app for Android. Uh, I apologize for any delay, but uh, I would like to say that the lecture, I would like to be some sort of interactive. So if you have questions at any time, feel free to raise your hand, stop me and ask me a question or ask for clarification, okay? <coughs> That being said, let's start. So nowadays we are living in a connected world. So every one of us is having a mobile device, maybe two or three. And uh, in 2015, it was uh, estimated that there are 2.6 billion uh, mobile devices around the world. Uh, the world population at this time were like around 7.5 billion uh, individuals. So this means like there are 30% as much devices, as much uh, uh, as there were humans on planet Earth. Uh, the number was projected to grow by 6.1 billion in 2020, which is a big number. And mobile devices are now are not just like communication devices as you have used to be maybe 10 years ago, but they are powerful computing devices. So, for, uh, for example, right now, a typical uh, modern phone, it can ha be having a quad, uh, quad uh, or octa cool processor. So, you can have a mobile phone with four processors or eight processors. So, they have uh, developed a lot over the last few years, and their computing capabilities have uh, increased a lot. And this offers a potential opportunity for having like powerful applications around on mobile, uh, mobile phones. In addition to that, a unique capability of mobile devices is having a lot of sensing modalities. For example, there are different ways you can interact with your mobile phone. And this is because mobile phones are equipped with a variety of sensors. Let's say one of the sensors you would typically interact with your mobile phone is your touch screen, where you can play a game or like use the touch screen to interact with the, with the phone. But there are also other modalities, such as speech. You can give speech commands. For example, if you use Alexa if, or if you use uh, Google Assistant in your phone, you can interact with your phone with your voice. Uh, there are other modalities, such as motion sensors, which you can capture uh, your, your walking and your activities. For example, if you use Google Fitness application in your mobile phone, it can count how many steps you have made, made in a day. In a, in a day and therefore can give you suggestions for your uh, calories, how many calories you have burned today, how many activities you have uh, you have made and so on. And in addition to this, it is also part with different uh, connectivity uh, mechanisms just such as the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi and others. So this together allows uh, for a lot of interactive and powerful applications. And let's talk more about, uh, about sensing modalities on mobile phones. For example, uh, most of mobile phones nowadays are equipped with GPS sensor, which can give you, uh, uh, can, can identify your location. And your location is not only useful for uh, giving you maybe directions, to your destination, but can also to, uh, use, be useful to identify a lot of inferences about uh, the phone user. For example, from your location, which is measured by the GPS on the phone, we can know like where you are right now. If you are going to UCLA every day, then probably you are a UCLA student or a professor. If you like visit a church on every Sunday, then you are probably Christian. If you visit a mosque, Every, every day, then you are probably a Muslim. So it can identify your religion, uh, your religion. It can also identify who are your friends. Because if we have like GPS locations from two different person, and we find that they typically go to the same place at the same time, and then from this patterns, we can identify that they are friends or they meet often together. 
can identify your shopping habits and a lot of other things. So sensors on mo mobile phones such as GPS, it can be powerful to identify a lot of uh, inference about the user and this can help in like having suggestions for the user based on, him, uh, on his profile. Another kind of sensor is the motion sensor, such as uh, there is a sensor in the mobile phone called accelerometer sensor, which is measures the linear movement of the, on the phone or the force applied to the phone. So you know acceleration is the second derivative of motion. So phones are equipped with uh, accelerometer sensor, which can measure the movement of the phone. For example, uh, this can be useful to identify uh, what are you doing right now, what's your activity. Are you walking? Are you running? Are you just sitting still? So this can be useful to identify your activity and what are you doing. Uh, it can also be identified for uh, it can be used also to identify, for example, transportation mode. For example, are you right now uh, driving, or are you on a, uh, are you in uh, a train, or so? Because the movement pattern while you are maybe on a train or you are in a car are different from the movement pattern if you are walking or you are standing still. So there have been recent research that have shown that you are uh, from accelerometer. Uh, signal, you can build a machine learning model. A machine learning model will identify the transportation mode uh, you are currently in. It can be even used for uh, identifying your driving patterns. So let's make it a, a step further. If you are uh, driving, some people like are aggressive in the driving. So, for example, they break suddenly. Some people are more relaxed while, while driving and uh, drive more safely. So from uh, sensors like accelerometer sensor, you can also draw inference about the driving, uh, the driving uh, behavior of, of the person. And does any one of you notice any problem with that? Does it cause any problem for the phone owner? You can be a passenger to the car and uh, wrong inferences will make about you. That's correct. The other thing is like, uh, do you really feel that all the time you will need to share this information with others or like make it private per se? Yeah, yeah it has a lot of privacy issues. So it has a, uh, uh, it has a positive effect that the more inference you can make about you, the, the more suggestions you can make for you, for example, for improving your driving uh, behavior. But for example, on the other hand, if insurance company knows that you have a bad behavior during driving, then they will charge you more. So it has a privacy problem. And when we talk about application development, we'll talk about how uh, Android handles this thing by having some sort of permission. So not, only, not all apps will be able to have all access to all of the sensors. But here we are listening to all the capabilities. How to, uh, difficult to it? It's not actually diff difficult. So you know a typical machine learning pipeline, you get the sensor data, you find features from them, and you apply classification. So if you have enough data labeled, then you can train a classifier, and the classifier will be able to give you a prediction of the transportation mod uh, modality. And recent research has shown that this task can be solved with high level of accuracy, but 90% plus. So actually, in our lab, we were participating in a competition last year. Yeah, uh, there's a, actually, firstly, pretty much the, almost the first paper in this space was by one of the students of mine, and uh, there used to be a paper at um, So we actually recently got recognized with Ten, 10 years uh, award. award yeah. because that technology, I mean, this is like I'm talking about 2008 or 9 or after 10. You then, iPhone had just come out, the computer was there, they were using Nokia phones and all. Um, and we were able to do things like, are you on a bike, are you walking, are you in a car, stuff like that. Now things have improved quite a bit. Uh, 
to the extent that some of the recent work that even has matched things again, some way, timing, and stuff like that, and can tell you that you were on a project some way, et cetera. So the more information beyond the model that you hear on this, you can do a lot more. Um, uh, there are competitions that take place regularly. So last summer, uh, I think it was Huawei, if I'm not wrong, yeah. or maybe Samsung, I forget. Uh, they uh, teamed up with the University of Sussex, and they run a annual competition where they release a data set, and uh, then you have to, uh, and of course, there is a hidden data set that they present when they show their test. Uh, so we took part in it. We did quite bad. We were like number seven out of eight, uh, <laughs> yeah, out of eight teams. Uh, yeah, an interesting lesson that we learned from that was that uh, we took the naive approach of using all the sensor data that was given to us. The, th uh, the team that, uh, not the first team, but team number two, uh, number two, only made, made use of two out of six sensors. Let's say each of the two. Okay. So, so that was one lesson. Second thing is that we were doing very well on the data set that was given, but we blew it in the test data set. And that's a classic situation of, anyone knows what that's called? Over Overfitting, Over yeah. Over exactly. Um, so, if you have a very high dimensional model, we were using a neural network model, and we only had a little bit of data. Uh, I mean, they basically released a couple of days of data. Um, so, our model was insanely overfitted on the data. Okay, so, we were achieving like 95, 96% accuracy on uh, when we were doing end code cross validation on the data that was given to us, and we were down to like mid 70s on their test. Whereas, uh, the top two, three teams had. So, uh, so lots of data, and I think choosing a model appropriately, I think that's a very important part, because if you pick a model like a neural net, which has tons of parameters and you don't have that much data, you are probably going to do very well, but that model probably is going to be a yeah, and its competition name was like the Haska competition. Yeah, Haska so you can find the data set and the papers from... Uh, yeah. Last year, one or so. So those data sets are public. Set. Everyone who participated, we made our code public. So all, all this stuff out there uh, is still out there. And basically, everything that you see out here can be inferred. Uh, while there may not be sensors for it, but you can. Like I mean, let's take passwords. You type on this. Uh, so when you type, the external can pick up the thing. And depending upon where you're tapping on the keyboard, I'm uh, sorry, on the screen, the uh, expiration Accelerometer signature is slightly different, so they figure out where on the keyboard you typed. Assuming they know what the keyboard is, which they do because you know, the keyboard is uh, standard for all OS, right? Uh, so basically, everything and a lot more. I mean, uh, there is so many more inferences that people have figured out. So other kinds of sensor who we uh, actually another yeah. one most interesting uh, one which is coming up is the following. I'm sure uh, many of you may have read about this opioid crisis in this country where people are, right? And so uh, can we detect, uh, like everyone has a smartphone, so people who are addicts, can we detect that they're overdosing and have automatically call medical response to them? So there was a paper out of uh, University of Washington uh, which has shown that a nearby, a nearby phone um, can using the microphone on it can pick up uh, uh, the respiration, uh, like when, when people begin to go into seizure and all, then there are um, kind of sound signals that pick up it. And so basically using that, they detect. Now, the only challenge there is that on your phones, you cannot really write apps which can keep the microphone running continually in the background anymore. Uh, you never code on iPhones, and on Android also, for privacy reasons. So that situation isn't quite, I mean, in the sense, if someone is going to go into opioid overdose, they have to keep the application up and running and all, so that creates a problem. But what I'm trying to sort of point out is that the existing suite of sensors can detect a lot of things. You just have to be creative and need to bring side information as well. Okay, not just models, but whatever domain knowledge you can bring. Thank you very much. They don't let you write apps at all. We have an app. Hmm? No. Uh, 
they have a skill score. Yeah, that's true. That's very different. Uh, so what skills are is basically in response to specific commands, what happens. So it's not like you can write a permanently running app which is running on your operating system. So they are, they are not based on that. Someday it might happen, but not not yet. And it's the same OS there, at, at least in case of uh, Google, but uh, it's a choice that they have made. Right. So essentially, Alexa provides a voice command interface to your apps. That, that's what it is. And there's something similar for apps on iPhone, so uh, called Siri shortcuts. But uh, like audio is always on. Alexa is always on. Alexa is, but you cannot write an app which is tapping into the microphone. And actually, it turns out there are uh, some other issues that come up also. So while on Android, I mentioned that now you cannot do it, but until recently, you could. But it presents some interesting ramifications in cars, because when your phone pairs with your car, then it makes use of the car's microphone, right? Mm -hmm. And that causes, um, yeah. so essentially what happens there is, Whenever an app tries to listen to the microphone, so the car thinks that the phone call is coming and so it will stop the music. Because, uh, remember, that's how cars work, right? I mean, so, uh, or the, or the Bluetooth pairing system in cars. So, there's still a lot of complicated issues, but I guess behind the scenes, uh, thing is technologically all these things are possible, um, but there may be usability limitations that. And another kind of sensor that's like also like important uh, on the phone is the microphone, as Professor Man has mentioned. Microphone, it has been mainly used for like phone calls, <coughs> but it, it now goes beyond that. So from the microphone, if an application gets access to the microphone, it can infer who you are because it can perform a speaker recognition. It can identify whom you are with because it will listen to everyone in the room and can identify whom the whom they are, or even where you are, because maybe the ambient sound in a Starbucks is different from the ambient sound at UCLA. And even your emotion, because your sound maybe seem sad, or maybe your voice may seem sad, or maybe seem ex ex excited. <coughs> so all of this kind of uh, identifications can be made from uh, the microphone. The final thing is that the phone is or mobile devices is, are not limited to sensors that are built in in the device itself. But there are uh, additional sensors that can be paired with the device, maybe through Bluetooth or through any wireless connectivity. For example, if you have a fitness band, like Fitbit, then it can record maybe your heartbeat. And from your heartbeat, uh, and then the data it collects, it will be sent to the phone over Bluetooth. And also another uh, class of uh, mobile devices are wearable devices, uh, for, like the smartwatch. So, for example, Professor Manny was showing me last week how the new Apple Watch, it has a very hard, accurate heart rate sensor. It can be used to get like abnormal uh, patterns in your heartbeats and it reported it for, for the doctor or so. So, the example we are showing here, which I'll describe uh, a little bit, in a little bit more details after a couple of slides, is this uh, what's called the Otisense chest band. So it's a chest band that can have like accurate monitoring of your heartbeats and your respiration rate. And this can be useful for a lot of inference, such as detecting to uh, detection of stress, detecting to of uh, cocaine or drugs in intake. And it can be used in a lot of other medical conditions. Yeah, so here's an example uh, of the Otisense chest band. So this is some sort of a chest band which has a suite of sensors uh, in it and it transforms the, uh, transfers the data collected to the mobile phone. And then the mobile phone can either process it or send it to the server or perform some analysis over the data collects. It is developed by uh, a research group mainly in Ohio State. 
and they have shown that it can be useful for detecting stress and detecting conversa uh, conversation and detecting uh, uh, drug over overdose. <coughs> Another uh, interesting project that happened at UCLA is uh, how to use a mobile phone app to do lab test analysis. So it's some sort of a microscope or lab on a chip. So you can use a phone app paired with a special hardware connected to your phone to analyze lab tests. And also detecting the behavior, behavior uh, during driving and also collaborative computing between different uh, drivers. So if you, everyone who is driving a car has a mobile phone application monitoring the traffic condition, then they can collaborate with each uh, other to have more accurate uh, monitoring of the road status. And mobile devices are not only... So actually talking about this road state, uh, when the space started, uh, there was a group out of MIT, uh, which uh, explored like a phone in your car, uh, as you are uh, driving, kind of keeps track of road condition and then driving habits and then stuff like that. Just recently, they got a $500 million investment from SoftBank. So their pre money valuation must be a couple of million dollars. Back, starting from current time. So, uh, in their case, insurance companies are buying into that because essentially pricing is now becoming based upon your actual driving habits. So. Good driver, you get a discount, and versa. Uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, monetization waiting to happen from things you can measure and then price accordingly. Uh, whether it is health, in Singapore there is a national campaign on if you walk a certain number of whatever ten thousand steps a day or something, and you get a monetary return based on that. So these, these these kind of things are happening kind of the world over. Measure and then you know, incentivize based upon that. Uh, they are basically trying to see, uh, they give you a driver score. So they went through, I, I think they started out with road condition and then moved on to driving habits. Uh, we had done a pilot out here in LA uh, with some biking groups. so. Bicyclists, if they're driving, kind of the road conditions of identifying sort of which are the good biking tracks and all. So essentially, the jostling that you see. But they basically soon pivoted to driver habits. Uh, and they start, like, if you have too many hard braking or if you hard braking, so they give you a driving score and uh, you all sort of move about more efficiently and stuff like that. And all. So that's their business model. Uh, but then they sell their service to create apps for like. Insurance company or uh, any other organization might basically or, uh, or, uh, build a custom app on top of your app, okay? And uh, like I said, uh, it is basically a couple of data science solutions there. Um, uh, that's all. I, I, I mean, I heard about the app called Ship, I've seen it, I've seen it So, so look, making these inferences is not hard. It's figuring out what to do with it. Uh, the company I'm talking about is called Cambridge Mobile Telematics or something like that. Okay. Uh, what they, they found out the right people who are interested in it, is how I would put it. And then uh, it has a network effect because more people buy into your, into your system, more data you have, better the models, and then it becomes kind of like this uh, improve upon. And uh, because we are talking <coughs> today on Android, I'd like to point out that Android is not limited only to mobile phones, but it can run on other kinds of uh, devices. For example, uh, smart smartwatches for sure. For example, uh, if you have a Moto X uh, a smartwatch, it is running on Android, and other kinds of smartwatches are running on Android. Also, you can run uh, Android on top of uh, IoT devices such as Raspberry Pi or Bigglebone uh, Blackboards. So there is a project from Google called Google Brillo OS, which is a porting of Android to this IoT uh, devices. 
and of course like Google Home Assistant, Google Home devices are also running a version of Android. So any questions so far? So in the uh, next couple of slides, I'll give like a brief overview of the history of Android and how did how was it started. So Android was initially developed by a company called Android Inc. And it was later later acquired and uh, acquired by Google. And then now the operating system is developed internally in Google. So uh, source code of the of the Android versions it becomes released to the public, but the development is happens internally by a team of the company developers. So it some sort of open source under uh, Apache license, but the development uh, model is not like completely open source because in open source project you expect that anyone can co contribute to the source code of the project that doesn't happen for android so for example if you find a bug you can report it to google to solve it but you cannot make a pull request or submit the code fix to them yourself <coughs> but what happens is because the source code becomes available to everyone so everyone can take it customize it build a new version as long as he he or she will satisfy the requirement of the Apache license. So that's why we find, in addition to the official Android release, there are other custom or third-party made Android versions. But the main branch of Android, or the main version of Android, it's developed internally within Google, uh, since they acquired Android Inc. And it is released to the public after the release of the Android version. So Android is a Linux-based operating system, and it supports different hardware architectures, such as the ARM, which is the most common one for mobile devices, uh, MIPS, and x86. So it can run on different kinds of, of devices. Android applications are mainly developed in Java, but that's not the only choice. There is another language called Kotlin. There is Flutter. There is a lot of frameworks for uh, cross-platform cross app development, for example, uh, there is a framework from Facebook called PhoneGap. So you don't develop Android app, say, in JavaScript. But what happens is this, frame, this framework will translate what you are doing in JavaScript to the Android byte code, which will run on the Android device. But the main or official language for developing Android apps, which have been since the start of Android, is Java. And uh, Android takes the biggest share of, of smartphones uh, operating system. So in the latest statistics of 2018, Android is, represents around 75% mobile devices. iOS takes around 21 in the second place, and other operating systems get a very small fraction. So Android is considered the most popular operating system for mobile devices nowadays. And Android versions uh, started with, there are different versions of Android. It started with Android 1, which is called Cupcake. That was in 2006 to, uh, to 2008. And it came with the first phone, which was called the G1. How can Android be before iPhone? I don't get that part. 2006 to 2007, Android came after the phone. OK, that's an interesting observation. Uh, I think Android came after iPhone. Yeah, I, th I think maybe the release was after iPhone, but the development project was development, started. Started. development project started at 2006. Yeah. So the first version was called Cupcake or, uh, and Donut. Then there came another version, which is Android 2, uh, Froyo or ging uh, Gingerbread. And this had uh, some improvement for the UI. It added the capability of speech, uh, speech recognition, <coughs> and it had uh, performance uh, improvement for application uh, running on the phone. Then version 3 was Honeycomb, which uh, came at around the same time that Apple has introduced iPad. So Honeycomb was an a version of Android that can run on both mobile phones and tablets. Android 4 is ice cream sandwich, and 4.2 is uh, jelly bean. That again introduced some UI improvement and it added the capabilities of download, uh, 
of what's called Google Play Services, which some application developer API that can uh, make it easy for uh, application developer to integrate their apps with Google services such as Google Cloud or uh, Google Drive and so on. <coughs> Then Android uh, 4.4, Cat and 5, Lollipop, and Lollipop had a significant change from previous versions. So uh, before Android versions, running an application on Android, it required, uh, it means that the application will run within a virtual machine on the device, which is called the Delvic virtual machine. If anyone familiar with Java, so in Java, an application runs within the Java virtual machine, which is the GVM. So Android apps used to run within their own virtual machine, which is called the DVM, or Delvic Virtual Machine, which is like a, version, uh, a virtual machine that is uh, specific for small memory devices. So it is a register-based virtual machine built in order to meet the capabilities of mobile devices which are small in memory. And applications uh, before Android 5, when they run on a mobile device, they run within a virtual machine, which is the Delvic virtual machine. But Android 5, it introduced something to you called the ART, or Android Runtime, which means instead of running in the virtual machine, applications are now will be ahead of time compiled, and then they will run natively on the device. And this happens uh, because at this point of, state, uh, point of time, they have found that devices are no longer having very small memory or no longer having very small storage, uh, then we don't know to, to sacrifice speed for memory saving. And as a result, it may be requiring more memory, but it will be three times faster. And Android 6 uh, came with some improvement to the uh, permission uh, checking, to one, which, will we, which we will discuss later. Anyone observe anything about the Android version so far? Maybe I can move forward to this uh, slide. So this like uh, the latest versions of Android. See, after Honeycomb, there is ice cream sandwich, jelly bean, egg cat, <coughs> marshmallow, nougat, Oreo, fuck. And remember, like before that, there was like cupcake, donut. So the names are First, they are all like some sweets or dessert. And second, they are all taking the like sequential alphabet. So I, J, uh, H, I, J, K, L, N, N, O. So you can actually extrapolate and predict what will be the next name of Android version. Probably it will be something starting with the letter Q and something that means a sweet uh, or, or some type of chocolate or something. So there have been a lot of development uh, that have done for Android because it is uh, like a big team of Google is working in developing it and because it is gaining a lot of popularity then a lot of uh, industry parties will be interested in maintaining it and making it a better operating system. So there are different players in the Android ecosystem. For example, we have the OEM uh, and device manufacturers. Unlike iOS devices, which runs iOS operating system, it runs on devices made by which company? Apple, and only Apple devices can run uh, iOS. But that's not the case for Android, because it runs on devices maybe made by Samsung, made by HTC, made by Motorola, made by, by different companies. And even anyone can, Get the source code of Android because it is available under a batch license and customize it and make it run on a new kind of device. And there is also like Google for sure, which is a company that maintains the operating system. And there are the application developers which build the new applications that run on top of Android. This can be either big companies or maybe freelancers or so anyone can with a very simple process, he can make an application and publish it on the uh, Android Play Store, Play Store. And there are the consumers or the end users who will like use the device at the end. So th th there is a lot of uh, influential players in the Android ecosystem. And the, uh, 
uh, the layer in between that connects application to vulvar to device or hardware uh, manufacturers is the Android operating system itself because this is like the middle uh, layer between that connects application developers to the hardware platform they talk on. So as long as you develop an application that runs on Android, it will run maybe on a Samsung or LG or HTC device as long as it runs Android. So this allows for a big uh, a big advantage of in interoperability. So your device, your application will run on any Android device regardless who, what is the company that made this device. And this is a simplified uh, uh, diagram of Android architecture. So uh, at the bottom, there is a Linux kernel, which is uh, uh, an open source uh, kernel. It is taking, and on top of it, you, there is Android system stack and the Android application framework. And on top of that, there is the application developer, like uh, application, application developed by uh, third party developers. So when you get an Android device, you know that there is uh, a Linux kernel. On it, and you, I'll show you later how to know what version of under, of uh, of kernel you are running. And there is there is the Android system stacks and application framework. This is developed by Google, and there is some apps which are either coming to with the device uh, firmware image, like developed by Google. For example, the phone dialer app or the messaging app are developed by Google and comes with you as part of the operating system package. But it can be also like third party apps. And if we want to give more details about the layers in between, which is the Android framework and the Android uh, system. So, as we uh, mentioned, Android is a Linux kernel. On top of it, there is like a hardware abstraction layer, which has like device drivers. And there is some native libraries which are developing like in C++ uh, for efficiency. Uh, and there used to be what's called Delphi runtime, which is the virtual machine that will run Android applications. But in recent versions, it has been replaced by what is called Android runtime or ART. And on top of that, there is some uh, libraries which are uh, developed mainly in Java to in order to make it easier for application uh, developer to communicate with the underlying hardware. Let's say I am develop developing an app who that makes use of the GPS on the phone. So the way it works in Android is that there is a Java library in the framework layer that will communicate with a C++ library in the serv in system service layer which will con communicate with a hardware uh, layer driver, which will finally talk to the kernel. So this sort of layered approach provides a good deal of abstraction and makes it easy for developers to worry less about how to handle the underlying hardware. This is just a simplified uh, diagram, but if you find if you want to find more details uh, at the list at the end of the slides, I have a list of reference that you can find more uh, uh, more detailed description of how this works. And to have discussed that there are different versions of Android, and this some sort of an advantage, but it's also a challenge. So here is the timeline since maybe 2010. After 2016, the different colors it means different versions of uh, Android. So in 2011, you see like this version of Android, which is like 1.5, it was taking around 20 or 30 percent. But right now, I guess it's taking almost nothing because newer versions of Android have been released. So almost every year there is a newer version of Android, and you see there is a shift because. Newer devices will come like with the newer version of Android, or maybe users will upgrade their version of Android, and maybe newer device will not support the old uh, version. So this some sort of an advantage and a challenge at the same time. The white uh, line is presenting what is the market share of the most 
popular android at any point of uh, of time so at any point of time it's around 40 percent of devices run a single version of android but there is a, a, a lot of fragmentation so if you want to develop an app and you want this app to be accessible by everyone you need to make sure that your application works on not only on the version you are targeting or the most popular one because this will present or represent only 40 percent of devices in the market but it will work well in different kinds of devices so what is more important the os version or the api version are the api version backward compatible it's the api version actually yeah API version. it's the api version and they're always backward compatible yes so like if i write for api 13 it will run on 5 uh, if you run 13, it will run on Pi. But the thing is, it cannot meet the new capabilities in Pi. Sure, but, but it will run. Yeah, it will run. So, yeah, maybe I can I should explain more about what's the ABI version. You see, different versions of Android they correspond to what's called an ABI version. So, the ABI version is the version of the Java libraries that's supported by this, um, by this operating system. So if you build, uh, <laughs> while, while you are creating a new application in Android Studio, as we will uh, demonstrate later, you are asked to specify two things, like what is the target ABI version and what is the minimum ABI version. So the minimum ABI version, it means your application cannot run on a device that's uh, before that. So if you are developing an application with minimum ABI version, equal 19 it means this application cannot run on a device that supports only android 17 and the target ABI version is the recommended version to run this software or this application and here there is another thing called NTK so we have mentioned that uh, the primary language for developing android app is java but sometimes you need to build some part of the app in C++ for efficiency or for doing like low level uh, computation or so or you have a library that is developed in C++ and you want to use it in your Android app uh, so this is mainly common in uh, augmented reality and for games and the support for uh, native code or C++ code in Android is called NDK so every operating system version, it has ABI version, which is the Java ABI version, and it has what's called NTK version, which is the C++ ABI version. But NTK is, is pretty limited to like either augmented reality or games or only special situations at which you will need high processing uh, capability. So like the NTK 8 version, like is that the same for like any API levels of 15 or? Uh, well, it, that means that, like with the release of Android 4.4, uh -huh. the newer API version was 15 and the NTK version was 8. And that has never changed, so it's still the same. Is that like the same for like API level 28, for example? Uh, sorry, what's that? Like, is NTK 8 the same thing as like 8? Is it, it like this? Like, API level like 28, is that like the same? Is that the same NTK level? NTK level? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't get it. So, as you are saying that like, NTK 8 is. Yeah, like, I mean, if I'm promoting with API 28, is it still NDK 8? Well, I got this screenshot today from their website, this website, so I assume, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, this is the official website for Android, and I got this screenshot today, so, yeah, I assume it is uh, the latest one. Okay. And there is not only fragmentation of... Uh, mobile uh, Android operating system version, but also in the device capabilities and let's say hard uh, screen size. As we have mentioned, like iOS devices, they run only on iPhone. And all iPhone or devices uh, have the same size. And maybe for I or iPhone 7, they have the same screen size. Unless you have, uh, yeah, not, not only, but maybe there are like two varieties of devices. Uh, or two, 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 two screen sizes, but for Android it's more fragmented because devices are built by different uh, companies and every de device has maybe its own screen size. For example, this is a visualization of different screen sizes that run uh, Android. 
So some devices have very small display, some devices have a large display, and even maybe let's say like this is a tablet and this is a phone, even within like devices like our phones, we see there is a lot of variance. And this is a challenge because when you are building an app, you want to make sure that your app will lock consistently on different screens. And let's say if I have a button and this button should be maybe 20 pixels, maybe on one screen, 20 pixels are taking like one quarter of the screen. But on another screen, it would be like very small. So in order to overcome this, Android EBI has some uh, good mechanism, which is, for example, uh, what's called DIB, Dynasty Independent Pixel. That's a new definition of pixel that's like, it expands or shrinks according to the screen size. Mm -hmm. And there is what's called the relative layout. Relative layout, it may allows you to organize the position of components on the screen, not according to absolute position, but according to how they are relatively defined to each other. You can say this component or this button should appear next to or on the right, right of or on the left of another component. So Android tried to solve this by providing like flexible UI design mechanism. Okay, now I'm going to discuss more about how to build an Android application and what are the components of Android application. But before moving on, any other questions? So, in Android application, there are four major components that built together an Android application. These are four, four major components are activity, service, content, content provider, and broadcast receiver. Let's start with an activity. So what's an activity? Activity is like a visual screen or a visual uh, <laughs> component that appears on the device screen. For example, if you are building a MacBook or a Windows application, so the component, the main component is a window, right? So if you develop a for, uh, an application for Windows, the main component is a window. So activity is the equivalent for a window on Android. So it is something that appears on the screen and the user will interact with it. Okay, and for example, if you have your Android phone, and within the phone there is the dialer app. The dialer app is nothing but a, a normal Android application that runs on the Android fr framework. So the screen you have seen that has list of contacts and the dial button and into call button, these are components within an activity. And each activity has a life cycle. So the activity life cycle, it starts with being created, which means the application or the activity is launched onto the memory of the device. And once it becomes visible in the screen, it is called started. It moves to a stage called started. And once it becomes uh, a <coughs> foreground window, so sometimes the application is visible in the screen, but there is another application like that is active. So sometimes it is in the background, sometimes it is in the foreground. If it is in the foreground and user is interacting directly with that uh, window or that activity, it becomes visible or it goes to a state called zoom. And let's say if you are running an application, the application is now visible on the screen, the user is interacting with it, and then you get a notification from another application. The notification from the other application, it, it takes the foreground of the phone. So your, your application becomes now bold or partially visible. But sometimes after it becomes bold, it can be resumed again, or it can become invisible. So it goes away completely from the screen. For example, let's say you decide to kill the app. If you decide to kill the app, then it will become stopped, which means it is no longer on the screen, neither in the foreground or in the background. And after a while of time, it may get be killed or removed from the uh, device memory. So it becomes destroyed. Okay. So this life cycle of uh, activity is important to know how to program an uh, application. And within the activity class, as we will see later, the way to 
built a new activity in your application is to inherit from uh, activity class given in the Android framework on Android API. So there is a class in Android Java API called activity. And if you want to create your own activity, then you inherit or, or execute this class. So once you in inherit from the activity class, you have the ability to overwrite specific methods. For example, there is an active uh, method called onCreate, another one called onStart, another one called onResume, onDestroy, onStop. So by overriding these methods, you can insert your own custom logic, which happens between the transition from one state to the other. That's important because, for example, let's say you develop an app which is taking notes from the user, and once the user has entered some uh, content in the app, a phone call arrives. Uh, a phone call arrives, and the phone call once it arrives, your app will go to the background, so it will be stopped. It will be first paused, then it will be stopped. You don't want to lose the text that the user has entered. So the way to save it is to override the on pause or the on stop method, and within the logic of the on pause or on stop methods, you save the current content maybe into a file, and within the on start or on resume, you load the content back. Does it make sense? We'll see later how how does it work, but it's important to understand the activity life cycle and to know that you have the capability of adding executor logic at the transition point from one stage to another. And activity is the most important component in Android applications, because if you want to build an application that have a visual component, like a screen, user interact with it, then you will need to use an activity. Any questions about that? Yeah, so for example, here is a case of uh, how to develop an activity. So, so <laughs> you need, that's the Java uh, language program. So you need to import Android app with activity class, which is a framework class. And you need to inherit from it, create your own activity. So you create a class called my activity, which inherits from activity, so it extends activity. And if you want to uh, add some logic when the activity is being created or moving from being loaded in the memory and going to into the created stage, then you can overwrite the class called onCreate. And within the onCreate, you call the sober class onCreate, which is the onCreate method by the parent. Uh, by the parent class activity, but you can also add your own special logic here. And something here is like, we have mentioned that uh, activity, it means that it has a visual component, it, it has some UI component that will appear on the screen. So how to define these components? <coughs> you can either define them completely in Java, in Java code, like adding components dynamically, like defining a button, defining a text view, or so. Or you can define them in what's called layout file, as we will show later. And layout file is a special format of uh, XML files that describes the UI of the activity. And in order to associate a certain uh, XML file with your activity, you need to use set content view and give it a handle for this XML file. So typically, within the onCreate method, you initialize your UI components, either by loading them from an XML file or by dynamically adding components to your activity. Any questions about that? And as we have mentioned, due to the challenge of uh, different screen sizes in Android, then Android is, provides a flexible uh, way for organizing components in, within an activity. This is achieved by what's called uh, layout con containers. So for example, there is a linear layout 
It means like if you add more than one component, they will be added linearly one after the other, either horizontal or vertical. There is what's called reality play out at which you have different components and also relationship between them. Like one of them is on top of another or one of them to the left or to the right of another one. There is like list view which organizes your items in a list and there is a grid view which is like a table cells of components. And you can use any combination of these layouts together. For example, you can have a linear layout at which here you have a relative layout that have secondary component within it. And here you have like a list layout and here you have a grid layout. So you can use an aesthetic structure of different layout containers to organize your components in the screen. We'll come to this later in a minute when we do our demonstration. And Android UI designer is pretty nice in helping you to do that. So you don't have to code everything in XML by yourself. There is a nice UI editor which you can grab and drop components or identify the attributes of different components. But here is an example of how to define the layout in the XML file. So you know XML file are uh, having three structure. So here you have a linear layout tag starts here and ends here. And within the linear layout, you have two components. One of them is a text view, and one of them is a button. Each component has some attributes. And let's start with the linear layout component itself. It has an attribute for the orientation. We have mentioned the linear layout it means components will add it one after the other, either horizontally or vertically. This one has an orientation called vertical. So this means that the text view will appear on the top of this layout container, and below it, there will be the bottom. But if we have this as horizontal, then the bottom will appear to the right of the text view. And for example, the text view and the button, they have what's called ID, and starts with this magic symbols, at plus ID slash. At plus ID slash is some special token that identifies if I want a reference from my activity, Java code to this single, to this in a specific component, I can use this ID to, for example, change the text view of this text view or changes the size or changes the color. So if I want to manipulate this component, I can get linked to it using this special ID that I defined in the XML file. So it's a way to linking what do you define in the XML file of, of components that you can access in the Java code. And this is the layout width and layout height. It has that content. That's another special way to define the layout uh, size in Android. For example, we have mentioned that one pixel in one device, it can, uh, or maybe let's say 100 pixels on one device can be having 10% of the screen, on other device it can be getting like 50% of the screen. So in order to solve this, Android defines uh, some flexible ways to define the size of components. One of them is the wrap content. Wrap content, it means like take as much space as needed by the content of this component. So it will like shrink or uh, expand in size according to how much text appears on it. You can also have a special, another special one called fill parent, means it will take as much as the parent container and so on. And there is also another unit Special Android called DIB, DNSK Independent Pixel, which is like device agnostic definition of a pixel. And Android has a support for what's called themes or styles. For example, if you define uh, a gift in your UI container, you can also have uh, what's called theme file, at which you define what will be the default color of a button, or what is the default col color of, uh, 
of a cake skew view and and or what is maybe the preferred size for a cake skew view. <coughs> this allows for easily changing the style of the application or the UI style of the application. Uh, that's it for the activity, which is the first kind of uh, Android components. Hey, anyone has any question? So to summarize, activity is a component that will appear in the screen, on the screen and the user will be able to interact with it. It has some components and it has a life cycle. And you create it by overriding the activity class in Java framework. And you can override uh, you by executing the activity class, and you can override some methods to insert your own custom logic that happens while making the transition from one sketch to another. And the UI, uh, the UI part of the activity, it can be either defined completely in Java code or within an XML file. The XML file has your components. And layout and layout containers and their attributes. The other two, uh, the other, the other uh, second important component in uh, Android application is what is called surface. And surface is more like background uh, part of your application. So it doesn't have a UI part of it. It is running in the background. For example, if you have an application and this application plays some music. So the process that plays the music, it's not necessary to be having a UI, uh, a UI. Maybe it is just playing in the background and the user does not have to, uh, does not necessarily have the UI all the time on the screen in order to listen to that music. It is often having that the surface is connected to a UI part. For example, if you have the example of playing music, there may be an activity at which you can't control the surface, like start the playing of the music or stopping the playing of the music. So in this case, it will be having what's called bound the surface. The bound surface is a surface that is connected to another uh, uh, to another component, which is typically an, an activity, and the activity that's bound to the bound surface will be able to make calls to that surface. But there are actually three different kinds of uh, surfaces in Android. First one is a foreground surface. The foreground surface is uh, is meant to make an uh, a background process that have a noticeable, a noticeable effect of the user. For example, playing music. And for the recent version of Android, it requires that this kind of service, it must display a notification for the user. So one example is playing music, but while the service is running, there must be a notification. Notification is what appears in the top bar of your phone. Another example, for example, if you download a file, Downloading the file may be taking several minutes. So it is better to be handled by service. You don't, you don't need to have the download progress all the time visible on the phone screen. But you should have, if you have it as a foreground uh, service, then it will have a notification that shows the download progress. Some other services may be running completely in the background and they don't have uh, a noticeable effect by the user. And this will be a background service. But foreground and background service have like only subtle change, uh, difference between both of them. So the subtle uh, difference between both of them is the foreground service will display an application, background service will not display an application. But they are running continuously. Think about it as a background threat. The bound service is different in one aspect that it is running to only when there is another component connected to it. So you can think about uh, to it as a server that gets started when someone calls it. And once the other one is done or no longer connected to it, it is gone. It will be the process that runs the surface will be destroyed. 
So the bound surface will be created when other component connects to it using the unbind method <coughs> and will be destroyed on the unbind, on, uh, unbind when the components are connected to it is gone. And during this lifetime, the client can connect to it by, uh, can make system calls, go, or, or sorry, uh, server calls to it. Uh, a special kind of function call or uh, RBC call. So typically you will need a service if your application has some part that needs to be running in the background. And creating a service is no much different from creating an activity. So again, you import the class Android with Apt service instead of Android with Apt activity, and you override the message that controls the lifetime of the service. For example, on create, on destroy, or on bind, on unbind. The third type of uh, components of Android application is the content provider. And content provider is used to manage the data for your application. For example, let's say you create an application that has, uh, uh, for example, storing the contacts you have in your phone book. So you want to have like uh, a modular way to access this data. Instead of writing like completely <coughs> ad hoc way for accessing the data, you can make use of the existing APIs for the content provider. And the benefit of this, it allows also sharing between data between different applications. For example, if your application owns some data and it wants to expose it to either different components of the same application or even components of other application. For example, let me give you a very uh, a common scenario if you are like having uh, a photo on your phone and when you click share on, on the phone screen you try to share it it will show for you like different applications for example share on Facebook share on Twitter share on uh, uh, or share by SMS message and after that it will display for you the list of contacts maintained by every one of these apps how to get get access to that data. The, the way it works, that the other app is exposing what's called content provider that provides the list of, con of, co uh, of con contacts that are maintained by this app. So this allows for sharing data between different applications and between different components of the same app. And it allows you to store your data maybe in a file or, but most commonly it happens using what's called SQLite database, which is a minimal version of SQL database that can run on mobile device. So far we have talked about different components. We have activity, we have surface, we have content provider. But how do they, uh, these components interact with each other? So in Android, different applications or uh, different parts of uh, different applications, they run a separate process for security services. So if you have more than one application running, uh, each one of them is running as an isolated process. And this is called as the sandboxing of uh, Android. In order for one process to communicate with another one, you need to make what's called IBC, inter-process communication. And there are different mechanisms for IBC, but Android has also developed its own way. So the way for uh, IBC in Android is called Binder. IBC. And Binder is a pretty much low level stuff. So in order to make it easier for developer, we have another mechanism such as uh, intents. So you can think about intents as messages that goes from one component to another. Let's say we have an activity and you want to start another activity. So what should you do? You should create an intent and specify the target of this intent as the other activity. And you can add a payload of whatever data you want to send as a message between the two activities. And the intent will under the hood 
be made uh, or be transferred as a binder code. So intent are messages between different components. And content provider, for example, if you want to have two applications share data through a content provider, is also another abstraction level of binder mechanism. So data sharing by content provider is one layer of abstraction on top of binder. Intent is the most common one, and it is used by maybe starting or sending the data between one activity to another activity, or between an activity and a service. And it can be either explicit or implicit. Explicit means you specify what is the target, what is the other activity or other service or other component that will receive the data you are sending. But you can make it also implicit. Implicit means you don't give the exact name of the other component, but you give some uh, attribute of it. Let, let me give you a, uh, give an, uh, a good example for that. Let's say you develop an app, and your app is interested in doing some uh, action when the phone battery goes low. So your app will create what's called intent filter. So intent filter is letting the operating system know your app is interested in this kind of events. And whenever the event happens, the Android operating system will make something called to broadcast. The broadcast will be intercepted by any application that has registered itself as a broadcast receiver for that event. And the broadcast receiver can be, identify, uh, can be made, declaring yourself as a broadcast receiver can be made by adding an intent filter in your application. So this makes us discuss about the last component of Android application, which is the broadcast receiver. So whenever some action uh, happens, either by the operating system or by another application, this application will send a notification. It's like publish subscribe mechanism. And other applications that are interested in intercepting this uh, event will declare themselves, themselves as broadcast receivers. So they can either declare themselves as broadcast receiver dynamically from the class Java code or statically from what's called a manifest file. Manifest file is a configuration file for every Android application. So every Android application it has what's called a manifest file, which has the Android name, the version of EBI it supports. It has a declaration tags for what are the activities and services in this application. And within the declaration of an activity, it has what are the intent filters of this activity. For example, if I create an activity with an intent filter that intercepts maybe the battery low event. It means whenever the battery will get low uh, on the phone, the Android operating system will launch your, your specific activity. For example, if you want to build an application that runs or gets triggered whenever your phone receives a phone call. The way to do it is to intercept the broadcast event of new phone call by declaring an intent filter for that. And on the Android website, uh, Android SDK website, you can find a list of all built-in broadcast events, but also it is possible for one application to define a new broadcast event. For example, if you, let's say the Facebook app, it can define a new broadcast, which is new notification received or new message received. And other applications that are inter interested in handling this event can declare themselves as broadcast receiver. Any questions about that? So we have got a little... Uh, so, so how do activities and services within an application work? Uh, by either binding to each other or so by intents. Also used for that also. Yeah. Okay. So or by or by intents. But intents are carried over. Binders. Over binder. So all all under the hood, uh, all IBC mechanism in Android 
yeah, almost all of them are uh, carried out by binders. But some things like content by, uh, provider or intents are abstraction of binder. Yeah, the final thing we will talk about after before moving on to the demo is uh, how to do power management in Android applications. So you know for sure is that if your uh, mobile devices are battery limited, so if you leave your phone without interacting with it for a given time, it will go to a sleep mode to save the battery. Sometimes you wanna the uh, some app uh, wants to prevent the phone from going to sleep mode. For example, it is doing the, like background processing, and if the phone sleeps, then the process will get terminated. So in order to prevent the phone from going to sleep mode, you need to do what's called wake lock. So Android EBI provides what's called bar manager, which is a system service defined in the framework EBI. And from the bar manager, you can acquire what's called a wake lock. So use bar manager to be your wake lock, and then to get out a wake lock. And wake lock could acquire, if you call it from your app, then the phone will not go to sleep unless at a later point of time you call wake lock for release. So this is some way for doing power management and if your phone needs to keep running for, uh, if your application needs to keep running on the phone for a long time, then probably you will need to use a wake lock to prevent this phone from sleeping and killing your app. But of course this will have an, a negative effect on the on the battery because sleeping allows for saving the battery on the phone. So for sake of time, I'll uh, skip the slides which describe the compilation process of uh, Android, but this all happens under the hood for you by Android Studio. And I'll jump directly to the uh, demo. So the main software for developing Android application is what's called Android Studio. This is like a free application that you can download from the Android website. And in Android Studio, you can start a new application. Let's say, you give it a name, demo, demo app one. And it asks you for, what is the minimum SDK version? This is the API version we have discussed before. If I choose like 26, it means my application will uh, will not run on any Android devices that have a lower version than that. It is recommended to give it a smaller value, not use the recent one, as long as your application does not use an API that's only in 26. So if you don't want to make use of API that's only in an API 26, probably it is recommended to use a version that's earlier than that to support more devices. And you can also identify if you will be building your app for a, a phone or a Android TV or for Android Auto, which is means for cars, or for Android Wear, which is like smart uh, smartwatches. So let's give it maybe Android 4, uh, about 24, and give it as a phone and tablet. And here, we discussed that there are four kinds of components in Android, activi uh, Andro Android uh, application. The most important one is an activity. So it asks you, do you want to add an activity to your application? So let's say yes and select empty activity. So it gives you like different templates of activity. You give it a name. Activity name is the class name, and the layout name is the name of the XML file. We have mentioned before that the UI is can be either defined in the Java code or in XML file. So in this case, it will create by default an XML file for you, and it will give it this name, and it will connect them together.
as we mentioned before, like building an activity is a matter of executing uh, a given class. The class we have mentioned is activity, but there is also like some subclasses of it that if you extend these other classes, you will be also creating an activity. The one we see here is what called app compact activity, which is backward compatible version of activity in this Android. So it will be backward compatible with earlier version of Android that don't have this uh, API. So the Android support B7 is what's called support <coughs> library. This is meant for backward compatibility between different versions of Android. But that doesn't make a huge difference. So again, you can either add components to your activity here within the Java code or within the XML file. So the method called set content view, it identifies which XML file has the UI for this activity. So here we see something called R to layout to activity main. What is R? So R is a name for a special class that's audio generated by the Android SDK. So if you click on the project here, you will see there is some directories that belong to the application. So you have something called manifest, we have something called Java, and you have something called res. Manifest, every application on Android, it has a manifest file. Manifest file is some sort of configuration file for the application. It has the application name, the application icon, the minimum API version for this Android uh, app. So for example, this is the manifest file of this application. It has a gag called application, and it has label, which is the application name. It has icon, which is the icon. And it has, within the gag, it has some children, which are the different component in your app. Right now, our app consists of a single activity. So we see only one activity gag. And if you are going to add later more activity or services or broadcast receiver to your application or content provider, then you need to make sure that they appear in the manifest file as well. Android Studio will maintain that for you. But some, sometimes, from time to time, you will need to customize something here by yourself. The other thing is like there is intent filter for your activity. We mentioned that intent filter determines when does this activity get start, uh, get start. So here, this activity intersects what's called action main. Action main, it means like this is the main activity of this app. So this, this is the one activity that gets launched when the user touches the app icon on the phone screen. Okay, so if you have more than one activity in your app and you wanna determine which one should be the main activity, you should add this intent filter to it. But now let's add some visual component to the activity. As we have mentioned, there is the layout file, which is under res. You see here, res stands for resources. And everything that's under this directory will get translated into some constant in a special class called R. So here we see R could lay out to activity main. This means that the file that's called activity main under the layout directory that's under the res directory. So under the res layout, we have a file called activity main XML. That's it. If you click it, you can see the UI components, and you can switch between two different modes. One of them is called the text mode, the other one is called the design mode. Text mode, it will show you the XML content of this file. The design mode is a visualization of the components. And here we have like a tree view organization of components in this file. And on the left, we have like a palette or a toolbox of different components that you can add. Let me add, for example, a button. 
once I drag and drop a button, if you switch back to the XML, you will find that it has added a button gag. And let me add a text view. And text view is some sort of a label, like some static text or some text that the user cannot enter. The user can just read it. But if you want to have editable text, then you can add a text field. So in this uh, UI, we have added the button, text view, and text field. You can switch to the text and edit their attributes, or you can edit the attributes in what's called the properties panel here. So selecting one component, you can I change the different attributes. For example, if I change the layout width here from wrap content to fill bearer, it means that the bottom width will be the same width as the bearer. Now, how to manipulate this component from the code? To manipulate this component from the code, you need to give every component a unique ID. So, for example, for the button, let's have the ID from button. Let's state maybe, let's have a button. Hello. And I change the text on it. Like to click me. And this one, I have the initial text as empty, and the ID is edit name. And the label, I have initial text of dots, and ID text will come message. And in the Java code, now in order to for example, I want to have an event that takes a trigger when the user touches this button to display a message based on the content in the text field. So I need to change the attributes of the label and <coughs> assign a trigger to the click event of the button. In order to do that in the Java code, I need to get access to that components or get a handle for them. So this happens by first creating an instance of each one of this classes, so an instance of a class button called maybe button hello and an instance of text view and an instance of name but this instance are initialized to be null how to make link of between them and what's actually in the XML file then at this point, after you first uh, specify which XML file you, you will be linking, you can link this object to the specific uh, button you have added to the XML file. Because sometimes the XML file has more than one button. So what is the uh, identifier? It's the ID attribute. So for example, back to here, the ID here is button hello. Then here, in the Java code, we say like button hello equal button find the view by ID and give it R put ID. <coughs> you see here uh, the R is auto generated class. So whenever you make changes to your resource folder, you you like define a new XML file or modify an XML file, the IDE will recompile the resource file and generate a class called to R. That's an auto generated Java class. And it will have like R to ID, which has all IDs that are defined within all XML files in your project. And find the view by ID, it will return a component for you. Because this is component agnostic, so it can return component of any type. You need to cast it to the correct type, which is a button. And text welcome, in the same way, will be text view. Find view by ID, R to ID, it's welcome message, and edit name, OK. 
okay? Now we have good reference for every one of these components in the XML file. Now let's add a listener to the button click. So we can do, do this by using a method called sick on collect listener and add a listener for that. And let's say on the on click. So here we assign a listener which is like a handler for the click event that happens on the bottom. And when this happens, let's say we wanna like make the text field show like welcome plus the name, enter. So it will be like text welcome plus sick text. Welcome plus edit name plus edit to string to Android. Now we can run this app. So you can either run the app in Android emulator or Android device. If you want to run it in Android device, then Yeah, here I'm having a problem running it in the Android device because when I started my app, I create my app, I create EBI version 24, while the device I'm having is EBI version 23. So can it run? So in order to solve this, let's go back to the manifest file and change. Actually, it's in the Gradle file, not the manifest file. So there is another file called the Gradle file, which has the compilation instruction for the app. So let's say the compilation SDK to be 23, uh, or maybe we can keep this to 26, but change the minimal minimum SDK version to 23 instead of 24, and build it again. So the Gradle file is where you can define the compilation properties, and also like some dependency if you want to add etc. library, <coughs> to your project, you can add it here. Now, I start the app. It gives me a compilation error. Why is that? Yeah, because I have one etc. On executed token. One executor semicolon. Okay, so the app has started on on the phone or on the tablet. So here, let's say I enter some name, maybe Mustafa, and I click Chase Welcome Mustafa to Android. Okay, so now we demonstrated how to build an Android application with an, one activity, add some components in the XML file, and manipulate them from the Java code, like adding a listener to the button and changing the content of the text view. Let me now demonstrate another application that make use of the sensors in the phone. So for a second of time, I'll walk through the code I already have built before. But it should be exactly no much different to what we have done earlier. So in this application, we have like two activities. One of them is a main activity. The main activity 
it has its layout defined in the activity main XML file. So activity main XML file is under resources layout activity main. It has like a button called continue. The button continue, it has a click listener. What happens when you click this button? It will create an intent to move to another activity. You want to launch another activity, then you need to create an intent. And in this case, it's an explicit intent because you give it the name of the other activity. And here we wanted to pass some data from one activity to the other. As we have mentioned before, the, the intent can handle or can take some payload within it. So intent is some sort of a message that gets transferred from one component to another. The other activity was doing the interesting stuff. So it was using what's called sensor manager class to get access of the accelerometer values. So in order to get access to different sensors in Android, in the Android framework, there are like managers for different sensors. For accelerometer, gyroscope, and this kind of sensors, the manager is called sensor manager. For the GPS, it's called location manager. Some sensors like uh, accelerometer, any app can access them without a permission. But some sensors that are sensitive, such as the GPS or the microphone, you cannot access them without letting the user know that this app will access the microphone, or this app will use the camera, or this app will access the GPS. This happens by adding a declaration tag to the manifest, which is called permission. But in this case, we are using accelerometer. Accelerometer does not use, uh, need a permission tag. So in the second activity, we get reference to the sensor manager by calling get system surface of sensor uh, surface. This will be a sensor manager option. And from the sensor manager, we get the default accelerometer sensor by calling get default sensor, sensor type accelerometer. And now we have the sensor and sensor manager. Next step is to create a listener, which is a callback function that will be triggered whenever there is a new value available from the accelerometer sensor. So we define it by register listener of the sensor manager. So from sensor manager, there is a register listener, and we give it an instance of a sensor event listener class, or sensor event listener class, yeah. So we make our activity implement that interface, so that it will have a message called instance or change. So now, whenever there is a new value of accelerometer available, it will call on sensor change. On sensor change, we'll get an argument which is sensor event value. It has a timestamp, the timestamp of the new sensor reading, and it has an array values which has the three different values of accelerometer. In this case, accelerometer has three values because it has x, y, and z axes. So within on sensor change, what we did is the following. We first display the diff three different values on some text fields we have added to the UI to the XML file. We also do some processing. For example, we compute the acceleration norm, the square root of x acceleration squared plus y acceleration squared plus z acceleration squared, which gives us what amount of force is applied to the accelerometer. And if it is above a certain threshold, we'll play some audio file. This can be useful, for example, let's say for fault detection, if you want to like implement it on a smartwatch and check if a person has fallen suddenly. <coughs> then maybe in that case, instead of just playing an audio file, you may be calling ambulance or uh, calling a friend for help. So let's demonstrate this. Sorry? 
That's a good question. So the file we play, you see here, it's uh, I believe the file by using media player, which is another framework class, and I give the file name by r to throw the crash. That indicates that crash file is a resource file under the resource directory. So under the resource directory, there is a directory called raw. Here I put a web file, which is the audio file. And because the IDE will auto generate the R class, which links to all resources that are under the REST directory. Now that is the app. First screen it has like box to enter the name. If you enter the name here, it will by continue button, it will start an intent with the name under as a payload within the intent to start the other activity. The other activity it says welcome plus the name it has received and it has three text views that are empty initially and a button. The button will start the listener for the sensor events. So once I start it, you see values started changing. Probably there is a bug in my code, so I am not updating the third one. I'm updating only two. But if I put a lot of force on the accelerometer, so the norm of accelerometer goes above a threshold and it will belay that sound. Any questions about that? So, okay. So I'll make the source code uh, available to you through Professor Manny and the slides as well. Okay. Thank you.